In part three of this lecture, we're going to do the same for monisms that we did for dualisms in the past. So there are four modern monisms that you've come across in the lectures before. Uh, behaviorism been dealt with in a previous lecture, so we're not going to look at that one. But the three we're going to look at in much more detail now are the identity theory of place, the functionalism theory of Putnam, and eliminative materialism of Patricia Churchland and sometimes her husband as well. So the first monism is that of identity theory. And this is also the first in time as well, so it's come from the 1950s or so. And the idea of identity theory is to say that mental states are identical to physical states. They're just the same thing. So I've, I've drawn this in my little circles and arrows diagram uh, with a purple colour, so not quite blue, not quite red. Uh, and MP there is mental physical state 1, causes mental physical state 2. So there's only one thing that exists here. There's just a physical mental state, and it's the same thing. And identity theory gets a little technical when they start talking about types and tokens, but essentially they seem to be saying that there are various kinds of mental states and you can always correlate each one of those kinds or types of mental states with a particular type of brain state. So for example, a pain is a type of mental state and pains correlate with types of physical states. For example, activity in the C fibers of your peripheral nervous system or in the insula of your brain. And as neuroscience progresses, all of the mental states that we are familiar with will come to be seen simply as identical to physical states. So there'll be a physical state which corresponds to pain, uh, another one for love, another one for desire or fear or hunger. All of these common familiar mental states will come to be seen simply as the same as a physical state. And this is a bit like how lightning of the past, so maybe it's not caused by Thor, the god of thunder, Instead, lightning is simply the same as an, an electrical discharge that just occurs between the, the ground and the clouds. So why might we go along with identity theory? Well, it's obvious in our day-to-day -day life that we do talk about the mind and the brain differently. So here's a picture of, it uh, looks like a man holding a brain in his hand. In my undergraduate degree, I, I got to hold a brain or two in my hands and it does look a bit like this. Um, it's quite heavy, it's quite firm, it's quite cold, it's been you know, preserved. So we would say some things about the brain, for example, that it's heavy or weighs a kilogram or it's quite cold and clayey, but we wouldn't say those things about the mind. So in our common sense view, we know that the brain and the mind refer to different things, but that's, that's not a problem for the identity theorist, because what's really interesting is what, what the brain does. And when it's in a particular state, it will have a physical state, and that's going to be just the same thing as a mental state. So we're not worried about having different sort of ways of talking to, talking about or referring to the mind and the brain. That's not a problem. And the evidence for identity theory is really pretty strong. So neuroscience, the whole, you can think of the whole of neuroscience as essentially trying to explain how brain states are mental states. And so if you put chemicals into a brain or into a bloodstream or into the body via eating or drinking, you'll know that alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, other kinds of chemicals can directly affect your mental states. Similarly, you'll know that if you damage part of your brain or, or it's degenerating uh, with dementia or age, then you'll lose certain mental states or you'll gain certain mental states following brain damage or following degeneration. So there's a direct correlation between lots of neuroscientific manipulations of the brain and changes in mental states. And of course, saying that mental states are identical to physical states, it just deals ne neatly with the mind-brain problem. They're the same thing. No problem. So who would disagree with this? Well, one common approach to disagree with this position is to say that, well, if, if brain states and mind states are identical, then you must admit that slightly different brain states must give rise to slightly different mental states. If two things aren't identical, they can't be the same mental state. 
So that denies the possibility that two, say, slightly different brains, or two different people, or two different organisms, or, or even two different machines, it denies that they could have the same mental states. They might be similar, but they're not the same. And so that rules out forever the possibility of, of artificial intelligence, because if you want to recreate human intelligence in a machine, you're going to end up with different biological men, uh, physical states and therefore different mental states. So you, you cannot recreate human intelligence. So for identity theory, the, the problem of multiple realizability is a pretty strong argument. And multiple realizability we'll get onto in the next section. And that's to do with how many different ways you can perform the same mental function. So a second major problem with identity theory is that it doesn't explain qualia or qualia. Qualia is the qualitative aspect of experience. So this is how it feels subjectively to be a bat or to see red or to be in love. It's how it is to be in a particular mental state. Qualia are used to argue against almost every monist materialist position on the mind-body problem. And this is essentially, this is the hard problem of consciousness. So while I, identity theory may very well explain all the easy problems of mind-brain interaction, for example, why alcohol makes you feel less inhibited or why caffeine makes you feel um, more excitable, um, all these easy problems of neuroscience might do really well under the identity theory. But the hard problem of consciousness, why it is that we have subjective qualitative states, is not going to be explained by identity theory. So a response to identity theory is functionalism. And this is associated with Hilary Putnam, an American philosopher. And his idea, or the functionalist idea, is that a mental state consists of a set of functional relationships with sensory inputs and responses, outputs, and with other mental states. And the hard version of this theory goes that so long as these functional relationships are preserved, then you have a mental state. And the picture at the top is trying to show this. So the picture at the top shows that M1 and M2 are two different mental states. Let's say they're being hungry and desiring food. So you feel some hunger in mental state one, and then you desire some food in mental state two. Those two things seem pretty well connected to each other. The thing about being hungry is it might come about in three different ways. So the functional relationship of being hungry might be caused by, I don't know, three different stimuli. Maybe in P1, maybe you see a picture of a cake and that makes you feel hungry. Or maybe in P2, your stomach starts contracting and making noises and that makes you feel hungry. Or P3, maybe your blood sugar is low and that makes you feel hungry. See, the idea is there are various ways to get into the same mental state. And it could be different stimuli, different inputs or outputs. Um, it could be completely different ways. It could be a, an animal feels hungry in, in one way and a human feels hungry in another way. Or it could be that a machine feels hungry in some way. So the idea is there, there are various ways to bring about these different mental states. And it could be they could be realised in multiple different hardwares and software, so like a computer, different animal, or different brains. And this deals with the problem of the identity theory, which seemed to state that to have the same mental state, you've got to have exactly the same physical state. So functionalism then is a bit more abstract, and it's a lot like a computer model of the mind-brain relationship. As you can see, the, the lots of arrows there, it looks a bit more like a computer. And the the issue of multiple realization and the fact that you can allow different physical inputs and outputs and different physical systems allows for artificial intelligence to be possible. So functionalism came about, I think, um, because of developments in information theory and computers in the 40s and 50s and in cognitive psychology. So it's like a, it's like a philosophical version of these two things, information theory and computing and cognitive psychology, the boxes and arrows, and much of cognitive psychology tries to recreate sort of a computer model of the mind. And functionalism is like a philosophical response to the invention of computers and the universal Turing machine, which you've heard something about in previous lectures. So that's a machine that can do any computation 
at all, based on a very simple system, just using zeros and ones. And it formed the foundation for all of the, all of the developments in modern serial computing. So another reason to like functionalism over alternatives is that it's not like radical behaviorism, because functionalism accepts the fact that mental states do really exist. You know, they, there is a mental state. There's, there's no problem with mental states. And also, they have important causal roles. So given certain inputs and outputs and certain, uh, certain system being present, the mental state will exist and it will have causal effects. It will create new mental states. So functionalism deals with the problem of radical behaviorism in that you don't have mental states. But unlike identity theory, functionalism allows these same mental states to arise in multiple different ways, different times in the same individual's life, different machines, different people, different hardware. And one sort of direct implementation of functionalism has been in neuroscience, and we have started replacing parts of people's brains with a functionally identical computer chip. For example, a cochlear implant is a computer chip which is implanted into the cochlear in the nervous tissue inside the, the inner ear and it forms part of the nervous system and it plays the same functional role. It receives sound waves coming through the inner ear and it converts them into neuronal signals. So we are already placing functionally identical computer chips inside people's brains. So functionalism at that level seems to be working. There are some very interesting arguments against functionalism. Two of them involve the nation of China, and one involves strawberries. So the first one comes from Ned Block. And he's, his idea, or his argument, was that if it's only functional states which matter in a system, so you look at the inputs, you look at the processes, and you look at the outputs, um, then he argued that a whole nation of people doing little jobs could be conscious. So say half of the country of China might be processing sensory inputs. So one person is given, I don't know, the color red and processes it, processes it a little bit. The second person is given the color blue and so on. So the whole nation of China could be performing individually very simple tasks. But in a functional view, it could be the case that the entire nation could be described as conscious. And I think the argument is that that doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem possible that a whole nation of, of individual people should be conscious just because they're performing a particular functional role. A second version of this argument was put forward by John Searle, who we've met before, and he's, he sort of criticises everyone. So he said, imagine a woman in a room who follows strict rules to receive strange characters through the letterbox, for example, Chinese characters, and then she's told to how to process those characters in particular rules, and then uh, puts the, the answer, if you like, out of the letterbox. And this person produces responses that are intelligible, if you speak the language of Chinese in this case. But, it, but it's not clear that this woman understands Chinese. She's just processing some arbitrary, meaningless symbols in a rule-bound way and pushing them out of the letterbox again. So this is Searle's Chinese room argument. The final argument is about qualia again. So imagine that you see something blue when everyone else around you sees something red. So here's an example of the image is a, a blue strawberry. Now, as long as everything else is the same, then the functionalist would have to say that there's nothing different about the fact that you see a blue strawberry and everyone else sees a red strawberry. So if you see this image and you say strawberry, and if you put it in your mouth and it tastes of strawberry, and if you, I don't know, go to the supermarket and you try and buy some strawberries, so all of these, if all of these inputs and outputs and behavioral and functional relationships could be preserved, even though your experience of the strawberry is very different from someone else's, then this, again, doesn't seem like it's explaining the problem. And this qualia argument is very difficult to get around. How can we actually explain the experience of blue when everyone else sees red, even though you have identical functional relationships? And this is um, Block and others' inverted spectrum or inverted qualia arguments. Another version of this is from Chalmers, and he talks about uh, zombies a lot. 
I think the argument goes that because we can imagine a zombie, philosophical zombie, this is an argument against functionalism. So a zombie, in Chalmers' view, is someone who does everything like normal. So it's a person who lives and breathes and eats and behaves exactly like everyone else behaves, except for the one thing is that they don't have any internal subjective experience. And although we, we don't know of any actual zombies, Chalmers says that because it's philosophically possible, that is a sufficient argument against functionalism being true. Now, I'm reliably told that there is an awful lot of discussion of zombies in the philosophical academic journals, and I personally, I don't really buy this argument. Just saying it's possible to imagine a zombie doesn't feel like, to me, that it's a good argument against functionalism, but maybe you have your own views. The final theory of the mind-brain that we're going to talk about in this lecture is eliminative materialism. And this is from Patricia Churchland and also her husband Paul. And the way I've illustrated this is by using Chinese characters again. Um, and instead of the mind and the brain and the mind and the body, I've just replaced these characters with something else, something completely new. And if you don't know Chinese, like I, like I don't, uh, then it's, it's not intelligible. I can't look at that and say, hmm, I know what that is. So it's, not, it's no longer mental and physical. It's something else entirely. The idea of eliminative materialism is it's a belief that we're currently using the wrong concepts to talk about the mind and the brain. We've just got the language all wrong. We've got the concepts all wrong. And it's also, it's impossible for us to know from our own experience how we should be talking about the mind and the brain. So the view of the eliminative materialist is that given enough time and enough research and some changes in the way we do science and neuroscience and philosophy. The familiar concepts of mind and brain and desire and belief and love and taste and feelings will all be replaced or refined or revised so that we no longer will be able to recognise those concepts from, from our new understanding, which will be sometime in the future. And when we get there to this place in the future, when we look back and think, oh, that was weird, why were we ever worrying about why were we ever worrying about the mind brain problem? Um, we'll just think, oh well, it's no longer a problem anymore. Um, and at that point, we can say that the mind brain problem has just been eliminated. And although this requires sort of a lot of faith that um, you know science will get there, just give it a bit of time. Uh, I find this quite attractive, this prospect, because it just deals with the mind body problem. So let's make an analogy then to an old problem, an old philosophical problem, which I think is basically the same problem. And I think if you think about the old way of thinking about these things, it feels like it's still a problem, but we've just ignored it and we've just moved on and we've eliminated the problem. And that's the problem of life. So what is life? So what what is alive and what is not alive? This was a real philosophical and scientific problem in the past. And it's um, a topic of the vital force, or élan vital in, in French, I think. What is the, the life spirit that flows through animals and humans and birds and maybe plants? What is it that makes something living compared to something that's not living? It's not a trivial question at all. So we can probably all agree that a stone is not alive, but a, but a beetle, it is alive, right? So a little, a little pebble, a little beetle, that's pretty easy. What about when we get all the way down to, say, a virus? Is a virus alive or a bacterium? And I think if, you're gonna, if you had to distinguish between those two, you'd probably say that, that a bacterium was more alive than a virus. But whether, whether a virus was alive or not would really depend just on your definition of what counts as sufficiently complex biologically or biochemically to be called alive. Now, I don't want to get into the the detail of how we decide something is alive or not. The point here is that people used to discuss this. This was a thing that people used to worry about. And for some reason, for some weird reason, we no longer question very much what's alive and what's not alive. We've just moved on. It's like we've discovered enough about biochemistry and photosynthesis and DNA and genetics and proteins and 
neurotransmitter. We've we've discovered enough about all of those things that we've got a we've got a good enough intuitive grasp of what counts as life. And so we just don't ask that question anymore. So the eliminative materialist argument is a lot of it is based on the history of science. So what kinds of things has science in general been able to explain? And what happened to the original concepts? Where did they go? How were they eliminated? For example, in physics, which has done very well in eliminating old concepts. Heat in physics isn't really used, whereas mean kinetic energy is used. Phlogiston is an old concept. They thought it was some property of things that burned. So when you burned them, they would release their phlogiston and it would sort of, you know, come up in smoke. And, and that, that's why things got smaller when they burned uh, and you know, gave off heat and such stuff. But that has been completely eliminated and replaced with the idea of oxidation. And in fact, things take on oxygen rather than give off phlogiston. The élan vital, the life force that I've just talked about, we now have replaced that and eliminated that with just a whole load of organic biochemistry. Something a bit closer to home, think about witches. So in medieval times, women usually who uh, who were slightly odd or had slightly strange bodies or who were just politically chosen for some reason were described as witches. And then at some point we got rid of witches and we called women maybe hysterical instead in Freud's time. And now we might not use either of these terms because they're not correct and they're not that they don't describe the thing that we're trying to describe. And we might now call it something like mental illness. And in the future, mental illness might be replaced with some sort of biochemical disturbance. So this process of reducing concepts from complicated things, which general folk tend to talk about, down to much more simple, explainable and fundamental things. This is the process of, of reduction reduction between theories, one theory of which is down to a theory of mental illness. And the concepts are replaced. They're not merely explained. We don't we don't still talk about witches. They've just been completely replaced. It's just not useful anymore. And so when non-scientific people talk about folk psychology, they're talking about the mind and the brain in terms of things that they're familiar with. So love, desire, pain, sensation, all that stuff. And we still do in psychology and the science of mind and brain. But these terms will one day be replaced, just as physics has replaced the terms for heat, for example. And so the argument goes that just because we feel that there's a mind-brain problem, and just because we cannot imagine how this problem might be solved, all that's telling us is that we're failing to imagine it. We just don't know what the problem is. It's our failure to imagine the solution and our failure to even comprehend the problem, which makes it seem like a problem. So to argue against eliminative materialism is relatively straightforward. Intuitively, you can just say, well, this just feels wrong. It really does feel like there's a mind-brain problem. Also, you can be a bit more logical. You can say, well, eliminative materialism is a belief in Patricia Churchland's mind. And that's a mental state. So if Patricia Churchland believes that eliminative materialism is true, that means that beliefs exist and therefore eliminative materialism must be false because Patricia Churchland has a belief. I, I don't think Patricia Churchland would find that very convincing. I think she'd just say, yeah, I'm just a human. I, I'm as fallible as anyone. I don't really believe it, although I'm using words about belief. I don't, you know, I don't need a particular folk psychological explanation to be true. And then, of course, qualia can always be brought in, as always. Some philosophers will just insist that subjective, qualitative phenomena just can't be explained away by saying the problem will go away. But I think the same could be said about life. Has, has the problem of life gone away, even though we sort of explained it? So those are our modern monisms reconsidered. Um, Identity theory uses evidence from neuroscience and neuropsychology to show how following brain damage or chemicals, for example, that your brain states change and your mind changes, your mental state. But against this idea is the idea of qualia, the fact that there are subjective states, but also that multiple different physical states could 
cause the same mental state. Functionalism is consistent with cognitive psychology, with artificial intelligence, and with multiple realizability, so it's an argument against identity theory. But again, functionalism doesn't really explain qualia, doesn't explain the philosophical possibility of zombies who do exactly the same as everyone else but have no mental state. And finally, eliminative materialism says the history of science is full of mistaken concepts which, given enough time and enough work, enough thought, they'll be replaced with the right concepts or slightly less wrong concepts. But again, against this idea is qualia. How, by eliminating the concepts of sensation and thought and belief, how will we explain what it feels like to be a mind? Deep stuff, I'm sure you'll agree. Ask me some questions.